corrupted. Burn the box. Out of the first talk, uh, the previous talk, you immediately realize that if there is no aid, what is done, the, uh, the need is capacity building. And in the earlier section, we heard about primary school. I will go mostly go to the level of the universities and the possible research that should be done. And that is what is badly needed in Africa. So uh, start for science is Paul Burke from Harvard University, who describes in detail how bad the situation is at the universities and at the even international institutes that work with uh, uh, money from donor countries to reach out to the national agriculture organizations. And it's probably something one is not always thinking about. Mm. I still need some dexterity, okay. And also, Calestis Juma in Harvard and Ismail Seregaldin uh, had a little booklet that's available for free. You can, uh, on the website, find it, Freedom to Innovate, to bring uh, the and help to develop the knowledge that in the Western world we have um, uh, created over the last 50 years at the level of technology and see that they can use it, contribute and be part of it. Otherwise, nothing will help there. And uh, you have heard that for agriculture, we had the Green Revolution. And it's maybe a moment to pay tr a tribute to the person at the left, Norman Burlaw. He just died at the age of 96 last October. He started in 1943 on breeding breeding plants that would be lower and having more of their uh, capacity in setting seeds and making more seeds available. That brought enormous uh, contributions in India. And you see uh, Swaminathan, who does now a lot with his foundation of the, the Global Village, but he was the um, director of the International Rice Research Institute and Gordiev Kush. They made really that uh, for rice, and it also worked for corn and wheat, we had uh, much higher yields and the new varieties uh, that brought uh, India from a famine to a country that now export agriculture products. That didn't, unfortunately, not work uh, for Africa. Africa suffered like other parts of India. Here is a picture of Malaysia that uh, agriculture was neglected. You have no seed companies for corn. Uh, in many places, you have 700, 800 kilograms per hectare, while elsewhere in the world, it's seven or eight tons, and sometimes 10 or 12 tons. And in the United States, the record is 25 tons. So it's enormous, the gap, and it's enormous because there are no seed companies and there is no body to really seriously give, bring capacity, bring the knowledge, bring the science. And then what happened all over Africa, that also happened to Malaysia, the tropical forest is chopped off for palm oils, for unilever, uh, for rubber trees, because our car not only needs uh, fuel, but we also need tires. So all the forest has gone. Indonesia will follow. Many places in Africa followed. And th then the biodiversity uh, disappears. That's what has been going on in Af in uh, agriculture development. OK. For, uh, United Nations did a big movement in the, at the change of millennium. In 15 years, that are the goals from the millennium. We will reduce uh, poverty, hunger, and you have seen it on many places. Two thirds of the time is over, and instead of 800 billion people that are hungry in the world, it's, uh, it's already a billion and more than a billion. Uh, on many places, primary school, we heard how the situation is, but we don't realize very often that if there are schools, there are schools where there are 150 children because nobody has money and they don't learn anything. There. And as soon as a farmer has a little bit of income, his agriculture would work. We would bring him the technology to work. At that moment, indeed, the 
they have income, they send them to private schools, and maybe they have a chance to, to go to high school and so on. I don't advocate that that is the solution. Much more should be done, but at least the facts are there. So how can we uh, bring in f uh, fighting disease and, and bringing further development through science? And the science that I'm talking about uh, will, will, is also needed to curb the overpopulation. People regularly, we've seen it uh, recently in The Economist even, uh, they la laugh with the intellectuals who always uh, come up with Malthus and say that there is overpopulation. Oh, we can grow more, and the, the world can take more people. The facts are uh, that we have tripled uh, our population in 50 years' time. After the Second World War in 45, we were 2 billion. 50 years later, we were 6 billion. We go now uh, merrily to 9 and 10 billion. If you see the surface available per person goes down, and when it's, it's at the level of uh, 0.1 hectare point, uh, per, in its predicted in 2050, there will be famine worldwide. And that are the facts. So till now, breeding helped, the classical technologies helped, but we have urgently to see what is science bringing us and what can be done. And the challenges for our agriculture is that this intensive agriculture that was brought there by the Green Revolution is polluting. We use a lot of chemicals, and that gives, if we always have to do it for more and more people, gives more and more problems. Uh, there is a real uh, environmental damage that is done the, in the United States, in the Mississippi River, the basin, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. You have the, what's red there, the death zone, where there is anoxia, there is no more fishes, because all the chemicals that are not used and all the fertilizers that are not used, excess phosphate nitrogen, is used uh, by the microalgae, the diatomy, and uh, you have this anoxia zone. We have it in the Baltic Sea, we have it around UK already. And more also is the industrial development. The whole chemical industry, which is now on petroleum, all the plastics, all the carbon compounds that we make is uh, out of uh, uh, petroleum. That's no longer available at an affordable price. So for energy, we can hope that new types of solar panels, the Gretzer panels that uh, work in another uh, system that sometimes uh, improvement of nuclear energy, maybe fusion, will give energy. But we, we need carbon atoms because that's the uh, basis of all our chemistry and all cars and all the uh, objects that we make are made of carbon atoms of these plastics. And this is the knowledge-based economy that the rich countries are going on, and that's also the knowledge-based economy that is needed in the developing countries. We have to build an industry that is less polluting and that is based on the progress that science is doing, and the science I'm talking of, of course, is the biotechnology. The GMOs that all the well-intentioned people are bored, they say, oh, how is it possible to, to talk about GMOs? It's, it's criminal to talk about GMOs. I ask you all, if you are, have this feeling, analyze where is the science, what are the potentials that can run, and agree that we badly need it, and that we, and that was the first slide, that we deny it to Africa the access to the science, that we deny them to develop their own. Well, they do it in, in Uganda, a, a little bit in Kenya, South Africa does it, uh, that um, to make them for their own products, so that at least there would be some income for the farmers. They would have more high-yielding agriculture. Because we are this problem that can be w become worse with climate change, that at the moment we have a lot of, of drought, and we only work on the, co on the crops uh, in our countries. But we need to have, uh, and I think the only possible solution, because all the others are much too slow, we need breeding. Breeding will make finally the plants, but the genes that we bring in has to come from the laboratory. And that has to be participatory all over the world. Not only we who have to do it. We have to do it for, the, for their crops. Well, maybe if I could go back, I was not, yes. Uh, that, um, that they traditionally use 
the sorghum, the millets, uh, and even latyris, uh, I would say a word of, uh, that are typical drought-resistant crops, below yielding, but because we were never interested in it. Urgently, we have to make this type of crops uh, for uh, the more arid zones. Latyris uh, of uh, it's grass pea, uh, that's in Ethiopia, it's a leguminous plant, the seeds you find it already in the tombs of the pharaohs because f many thousand years ago we knew that this was v nutritious, uh, that they could really stand all possible droughts and also floods. After three uh, weeks of flooding, when all the plants die, Latyris still survives. But why is it not used mo more? Why is nobody trying to make a high yielding Latyris? Because there is a toxic compound in it that makes uh, male persons cripple after 50. But in the whole history, no, in all those days, nobody became 50. And uh, if children don't survive, uh, people use it. So it's now our duty as scientists, as biotechnologists, to raise the funds. I tried for 20 years, didn't work, uh, for just take, a, take out this toxic compound because now we know genomes, sequencing of DNA is bec becoming affordable. Analyzing all that is becoming affordable. So we should give to Africa latyrus that is not toxic, that they can grow. Uh, at the moment, if you talk to science, there is this right part that's called systems biology. Fantastic ev evolutions in our countries on finding all these biochemical pathways, how these different interact. And we are able at laboratory scale to have double and triple yield. At laboratory scale, we can make all kinds of products, good oils and, uh, and more nutrition and plants. But we have to do that together with the people in the field who know what the plants is and do it for the people, with, for their agriculture, not only for our chemistry. And that's what's in. And when I'm speaking here, that's because in Ghent, Jeff Shell and myself, 35 years ago and more, we found that there is a bacterium in nature that does genetic engineering. We, we found out the way it inserts novel genes in plants. Uh, we were able to use that on model plants, and now, since 96, it's used for some crop plants, and like cotton, and it's an enormous success. Ask to the farmers in Burkina Faso. Uh, finally, you have uh, uh, cotton plants that you don't have to spray 20 times with toxic compounds, uh, expensive and uh, also damaging for health for them and the children because, in, of course, they don't do, don't do it in protected suits. They just send the children in. So when we talk GMOs at the moment, it, there is a whole development, but everybody is against because well-intentioned environmentalists, and I think we all the scientists and the molecular biologists are environmentalists. We all have to take care of our planet. That's not the problem. But what is the science behind it? And use the science that is behind it. So they say it's toxic for health. Not the slightest indication is there. All are fake stories. And many of you know it, but the outside world doesn't know it and still think about Frankenfurt. Not, not the slightest uh, uh, story against it has been identified. The same for the environment. Many advantages, uh, uh, situations have been shown for no tillage agriculture that you don't waste the topsoil. It's badly needed in Africa, and we will see we have to use it. Next slide, please. We have to explain to society that these genes that are flying, that are not damaged, that a genome is something dynamic, that the whole world is a laboratory of genetic engineering. All segments that rearrange, that cross out, that spread out, never anything specially damaging uh, for our environment is happening. If there was not this mobility, then our environment were, uh, would be damaged. And we are damaging our environment. So we have to see that we make the plants that protect the, pl uh, the wildlife and the biodiversity that's still left. There is a problem. 
because the well-intentioned people made that the price tag for making GM plants is very high. They have given the monopoly to Monsanto, Dow, DuPont, uh, Syngenta, uh, Bayer, BASF. There are six or seven companies who made GM. At the, all universities want that Africa can make themselves. And it's the basis of knowledge of the new capacity that the people would make their plants themselves. Next slide, please. I am convinced that in 21st century, and surely China is convinced, and Indian is convinced, uh, will be productivity in agriculture, feed production for the animal, and mostly for industry through GM plants. Next slide, please. So I think it's our duty to communicate that to the different uni uh, universities, research institutes, and all together, if we have this type of environment for our increasing population, then the people will have an income. In Africa, the crops will be yielding like they are yielding here. And then we will have money saved, there will be education, there will be industrial development. And most of all, we have to discuss with our colleagues in the environment that we will, in that way, protect the environment. And what is still left as tropical forest can remain if we make a double and triple yield on our agriculture. And that's the challenge, and I think that was the reason why Walter asked me to be here. Thank you.